Hey there guys and welcome back to Maho Profile, a history of magical girls. Last episode, I talked a bit about Osamu Tezuka and his most famous creation, Astro Boy. In 1952, when the first pages of Astro Boy debuted, the manga world was hugely different from the one we know today. Most manga in the late 1940s and very early 50s were lighthearted stories targeted at children since manga was cheap to produce and children were in sore need of cheerful entertainment in the years following World War II. Tezuka tends to get credited as a key creator of this period thanks to his stories having more exciting stakes and mature pathos than was typical at the time. He's also highly praised for his lively Disney-esque art, cinematic panel compositions, and star system of frequently recurring characters. However, while it's easy to point to Tezuka's influence in the world of manga, and we'll definitely be coming back to him when we talk about Marvelous Melmo, there were plenty of other influential manga artists working in the 50s and 60s that don't get nearly as much credit as they should. Tezuka was hardly the only creator trying to tell different kinds of stories with manga, either at that time or previously. Two such creators are going to be important to us in this episode and the next one, Fujio Akatsuka and Mitsuteru Yokoyama. Both were men, as were most major girls manga artists prior to the mid-1960s. Female manga artists existed before then, of course, and they deserve lots more recognition as well. But on the whole, manga societies were not super open to lady artists at this point. Still, both Akatsuka and Yokoyama were undeniably instrumental in the birth of the magical girl genre. Starting with Fujio Akatsuka, he was the creator of the manga Himitsu no Akko-chan, aka Akko-chan's Got a Secret. We'll go more into Akatsuka in the next episode when we talk about the Akko-chan anime, but it's worth bringing him up now in the timeline because Akko-chan was the first magical girl manga, debuting in July 1962 in the girls' manga magazine Ribbon. Ribbon itself goes back to 1955 and is still publishing to this day, focusing on manga for ages 9 to 13. This magazine has been home to tons of manga that spawned anime that we'll be covering eventually, including Nurse Angel Lyrica, Hime-chan's Ribbon, Pomu no Sagashite, and the subject of today's episode, Mahotsukai Sally, aka Sally the Witch. Mitsuteru Yokoyama, a creator usually more associated with titles aimed at boys, such as Giant Robo and Tetsujin 28, debuted the manga version of Sally the Witch in July 1966, four years after the Akko-chan manga. The idea for writing a series about a witch came to him after seeing the American sitcom Bewitched, which aired in Japan as Oksama wa Majo, aka My Wife is a Witch. This is a pretty straightforward title. <laughs> Yokoyama had originally conceived of his series as Sunny the Witch, but ended up changing the name due to the Sony Corporation having copyrighted the name Sunny. So, Sally it was. The manga was short, only lasting one year, and later being released as a single volume. Before that short run was over, though, Yokoyama licensed his series to Toei Doga, the same company who produced Tale of the White Serpent, which we covered last episode. And in December of 1966, the first episode of Sally the Witch aired, making it the first bona fide magical girl anime. Heck, it was the first anime aimed specifically at girls, period! Nice! The story starts with a child witch named Sally who is the princess of a magic kingdom. One day on a whim, she decides she's bored of studying magic and wants to visit the human world instead, so she skips out on studying and does just that. When her parents find out she's gone, they send another magical child named Cub after her to try and convince her to come back home. The parents don't go after her themselves because, I don't know, they've got stuff to do, I guess. They're busy. Anyway, it's too late. Sally has already made friends and she's decided she likes the human world so much that she wants to stay in it. She creates a home for herself. Literally, she conjures a super swanky house out of thin air and then sets up Cub to pose as her younger brother carving out a life for herself as Sally Yumino, the quirky rich girl down the street who always lends a hand to those in need, from cake making to babysitting to grassroots advertising campaigns to fighting organized crime. You know, as eight-year-olds do, all the time. <laughs> she does it. She... <laughs> Look at her go. So yeah, those are the basics of the story. It's not actually that similar to its influence, Bewitched, aside from, well, the whole witch angle. Bewitched is for the most part a domestic series about suburban adults living suburban adult lives with magic thrown in to mix things up for comedy. 
Sally, on the other hand, follows manga trends of the period and aims itself very squarely at kids. As such, it leans a lot more on cartoon slapstick than on the domestic or verbal comedy of Bewitched. Another major difference is that, unlike the witch Samantha, who actively tries to suppress and hide her magic, You gave me your word, no more, uh, stuff. <laughs> so that she can be the best little suburban housewife she can, why hello, 1960s patriarchal values. <laughs> Maybe I can tape her off. <laughs> there is no one that Sally is trying to please other than herself and her friends. She does nominally have to hide her magic from humans, but her major goal in the series isn't to resist her magic side. Sally loves being a witch, and takes full advantage of her powers whenever she can. What's more, she rarely seems to suffer any consequences from using magic either. And in fact, her magic is more often than not an unambiguously good solution to a problem, as opposed to something that causes unintended trouble. In this way, young viewers, especially young girl viewers, are allowed to indulge in a magical power fantasy through Sally without much, if any, implicit judgment for enjoying themselves. This kind of power fantasy is important for young kids to experience for self-confidence building. So Sally normalizing this kind of fantasy for young girls in Japanese pop culture this early on is, in theory, a big positive. We'll get into the nuances of how that idea works in practice as Maho Profile progresses, but for now, yay, girl power! Anyway, no, the trouble in this show usually comes less from magical consequences and more from other characters actively trying to cause trouble. Mostly it's Cub who causes trouble. Actually, almost always. Yeah, Cub, he may look cute, but he is actually an unbelievable dill hole. The tricks he plays on Sally and company often go way past childish pranks and right into straight up villainy. For example, there is an episode where Sally and friends are trying to help out a classmate with a fortune-telling stand. Cub is so annoyed that he's not the center of attention that he tries to ruin the classmate's reputation. Another time, Cub tries to get Sally's neighbors, the Hanamuras, thrown out on the street because he is having a tiff with the Hanamura triplets. And another time, when Sally goes on a class picnic without him, Cub plays pranks on the girls follows them around despite Sally repeatedly telling him no, and then, get this, he teams up with a royal servant from the Magic Kingdom to create a severe thunderstorm, endangering Sally's entire class and injuring one of her friends. And then, both Cub and the servant transform into dinosaurs and have a full-on magical creature battle with Sally, which Sally only manages to win with help from her mother. All because someone didn't get to go on a stinking field trip! <laughs> and may I remind you, Cub is not a villain in this show. He's a major supporting cast member and is portrayed sympathetically in most episodes. Yet he pulls these awful annoying stunts all the time. Yeah, yeah, Cub is pretty much the worst. <sighs> Similarly mischievous, but much more enjoyable, are the aforementioned Hanamura triplets. They cause a lot of trouble on their own, but seeing as they are normal human children, unlike whatever Cub is supposed to be, they never quite sink to the sheer levels of spite that Cub does. They're more along the lines of lovable scamps who, yes, play pranks and cause problems, but you can see enough heart to them that you can't help but like them despite that. This is especially apparent in the way they treat their older sister, Yoshiko Hanamura. Yoshiko, or Yotchan, is one of the first people Sally meets in the human world, and she becomes friends with Sally pretty quickly, despite being initially freaked out by things about Sally that she can't quite explain, like appearing ice cream out of nowhere and moving rugs and stuff. So, seems like something you'd question a little bit more, but okay. Yoshiko is the eldest of the Hanamura children, and despite having a laid-back and casual attitude, she's a very responsible girl who takes care of her brothers to the best of her ability in the absence of their dead mother. And her brothers, for the most part, are respectful of her for that, and behave themselves when she's around. <clears throat> Usually. The second episode shows pretty well how the four of them stick up for each other. Like I said before, the Hanamuras are in danger of getting thrown out of their house, specifically because their father is late on paying the rent. It's Yoshiko's responsibility to go and get the rent for the landlord, and the triplets stall for time for her by demanding the landlord show proof that their father promised a decision about the rent by a certain date. 
Dang, these kids are savvy about real estate contracts. When the landlord comes back with the proof, they continue to defend their father and sister and refuse to leave the house, even working together to move furniture back in that the landlord is trying to have moved out. And of course, Cub teleports furniture back out again so he can expedite the process of getting thrown out on the street because Cub is awful and the worst and <laughs> Anyway, this episode in general is pretty fun and a good intro to these supporting characters. There are other members of the cast as well, like Sally's other friend Sumire, a baseball playing classmate named Ken, and another witch girl named Poron, who shows up much later on and actually rivals Cub for the title of most awful hell child on earth. Plus, of course, Sally's parents are still around from time to time, with her dramatic, pointy haired dad being particularly fun to watch. Plus, there's. God? I think he's Sally's grandpa. He's lovely. With all these colorful side characters, we should expect our heroine to be just as fun and lively to match. And, well, yeah, a lot of the time she is. Like I said, Sally loves being a witch, and the joy she takes in using her magic is pretty hard not to be charmed by. <clears throat> Pun 100% intended. She isn't just a one-note role model protagonist as I feared she might be. She is largely sweet and pleasant, for sure. But like Cub and the triplets, Sally can also be a bit mischievous. She can be cheeky, she can be ticked off, and even just a little bit spiteful herself. Like, okay, teaching the school bully a lesson through magical hijinks is fun and all. It's always great to see a jerk get his comeuppance, I get that. But seriously, when you've got the kid up a tree, at your mercy, literally begging you for his life, and you are sawing the trunk in half beneath him for the express purpose of crushing him, that is just a little further than most kids take their revenge, Sally. Good god. She's just straight up Terminator here. Hasta la vista, bully! Attempted murder aside, Sally is usually at her most interesting when the show focuses on one of two things. The first is her youth and inexperience, the girl part of Magical Girl, if you will. Like I said earlier, usually Sally's magic goes off without a hitch for the sake of whatever the plot requires, which creates the base power fantasy for the show. However, sometimes you'll get episodes that highlight how much Sally has yet to master, which keeps the show from becoming a dull string of constant successes. Take episode 6, for example. By this point, Sally's parents have more or less accepted that their daughter isn't coming home for a while. However, they at least want to make sure that she's still keeping up with her magic studies. To that end, they send in Sally's grandmother, a strict, grouchy old witch, to act as a magic tutor. Here we get to see Sally fail at a couple of things for once, like not being able to walk through a wall, getting the ingredients for poison apples wrong, creating an apple tsunami, creating abominations of nature that are horrified by their own existence, you know, mistakes anyone could make. This does a nice job of reminding the audience that Sally still has a lot of growing to do despite how powerful and accomplished she seems, and it sets a precedent for the inexperience and awkwardness of youth being a staple part of the magical girl genre. The other thing that makes for an interesting Sally episode is a focus on her otherworldly nature, the magical part of Magical Girl. Sally looks and acts human for the most part, but sometimes the show reminds viewers in no uncertain terms that she did not grow up on Earth. Heck, she might not even have the same biology as Earth humans. Episode 11 is a really good example of this. Sally's teacher talks about tears and what makes people cry. Sally reveals that she has never cried before. Not once. Not even as a baby. She may not even be physically capable of it. After realizing that her friends think it's weird and disturbing that she never cries, Sally spends the rest of the episode trying to understand tears, wishing she had them herself. She eventually tries using magic contact lenses to simulate them, but this gets predictably awkward results. Then things come to a head later when the class finds their goldfish dead one morning, and the only one who doesn't cry about it is Sally. The other children find this suspicious and accuse her of killing the fish. Sally runs off, but then overhears the teacher defend her to the other students. Touched by his actions and the acceptance of her classmates after that, 
Sally finally sheds real tears. Admittedly, I find this a bit of a cop-out since it would have been nice to see Sally being accepted 100% as she is, tears or no tears. Still, it's a sweet moment all the same. The whole episode is just really effective, especially for a show this old. It operates on a principle that's common to most good fantasy and speculative fiction, using an otherworldly character or situation to draw attention to or reframe something about the human condition. In this case, Sally being unable to cry makes young viewers think about what being able to cry means for them, how it makes them feel, how it connects them with other people. It's a simple narrative trick in this case, but it works like, well, magic. Shifting gears a little bit, the last couple episodes I've highlighted have been in black and white, but you may have noticed some color clips earlier on. Sally started its run in black and white, but starting with episode 18, the series switched to color production, making it one of the earliest TV anime to adopt color. This was in line with Toei's continuing ambitions to be the top animation studio in the country. Remember our friend Mr. Okawa from last episode. It's questionable how well they maintained that title, considering they eventually ended up bleeding staff left and right due to unsatisfactory compensation and working conditions. However, it is at least true that Toei helped create almost an entire new generation of animation talent through their Toei University training system. So a lot of the old guard in anime are thankful to the studio for that at least, if still somewhat disgruntled. In any case, from episode 18 onward, Sally the Witch continued broadcasting in color until the end of its 109 episode run. Yep, you heard right, 109 episodes. Oh boy, you'll excuse me if I didn't watch every single episode for this video, especially since only a handful have been fansubbed. Unfortunately, the series never saw an English release of any kind either, so there is no legal way for English-speaking fans to watch this series, short of owning an all-region DVD player and importing the Japanese box set. Thankfully, several other countries did get dubs of the series, including Mexico, Italy, Poland, and several South American countries. So if you speak Spanish, Italian, or Polish, you may have luck finding episodes out there that you can watch. Frustratingly, there was one dub that aired in Canada, but it was in French. Ah, c'est le Québécois. Still, it's a shame for English-speaking fans because while it's not the most dramatically riveting series, to say the least, Sally the Witch is still a charming little show. I was honestly surprised by how much of its cuteness and humor still hold up despite the cheap animation and old-fashioned sensibilities. It has the same kind of charm as an old Disney or Tom and Jerry cartoon. Plus, it has the added bonus of being a little more complex than most old Western cartoons, which is really nice to see for a kid's show from this time period. And speaking of old Western cartoons, Due to the influence of imported Disney cartoons during the post-war occupation, there are a lot of Disney references in Sally the Witch, such as this scene where Sally's grandma talks about poisoned apples while dressed like the evil queen from Disney's Snow White. Or there's this scene where Cub is waving his fingers back and forth to make a broom dance and walk, much like a certain magical mouse did in Fantasia. Most striking is probably the final episode where- <gasps> SPOILERS FOR 50 YEAR OLD ANIME! Sally and Cub finally return home to the Magic Kingdom in a flying carriage. Which looks a heck of a lot like a mix of two carriages from Disney Cinderella. And if the reference weren't obvious enough for you, Sally and Cub leave as the clock chimes midnight, their house vanishing into the ether like the last of Cinderella's magic. There are lots of other references I could point to, both obvious and more subtle, but really finding all the Disney influences and references in Sally could probably be its own video. So for now, I'll just say that this strong influence is very interesting to look back on with modern eyes. Disney-esque representations of princesses and jewels, carriages and castles, heck, even witches, are all things that we see not just in Sally, but in many Magical Girl series to follow. So this is definitely a topic we'll be touching on again in future episodes. Another topic we'll be touching on again for sure is the connection some of the staff on this show have to other Magical Girl shows, and to the wider history of anime. 
There isn't really much to say about the writing or direction of the show, since those duties were all shared by multiple people from what I can find. However, a lot of the voice talent we will definitely be seeing again later. Michiko Hirai, who played Sally, will see again playing a mother role in Maho no Mako-chan. Sachiko Chijimatsu, the voice of Cub, we'll see again as Mieko in Sarutobi Echan, Twin Panther in Cutie Honey, and other bit parts in shows like Mako-chan, Megu-chan, and Tickle as well. Fuyumi Shiraishi, the voice of Poron, would later be the talking cat mascot in Lun Lun the Flower Child. And Kenji Utsumi, Sally's dad, didn't do many other Magical Girl series, but he did have a huge decade-spanning career, and fans today probably know him best as Shenlong from Dragon Ball Z, Rao from Fist of the North Star, and Armstrong from Full Metal Alchemist. Oh yeah, and there's also Masako Nozawa, the voice of the triplets and Sally's mom, who's done, you know, a few bit parts here and there, a few parts in Limit-chan, Akko-chan, Chappie, and, oh, I don't know, Tetsuro in Galaxy Express 3-9, Kitaro in Gegege no Kitaro, and mother and Son Goku in mother and Dragon Ball Z. Oh, shit! <laughs> However, the most well-known staffer on this show was not a voice actor, a writer, or a director, but a lowly animator who was making a name for himself as the head of the Toei Labor Board, a promising young upstart you may have heard of named Hayao Miyazaki. Yes, Mr. Anime was a mistake himself worked on Sally the Witch. Actually, Miyazaki originally wanted to work for Toei after being inspired by Tale of the White Serpent. The scale and wonder of the film left a huge impact on him, and he even admitted to having fallen in love a little bit with the character of Banyang. That's right, you have a proto-magical girl in part to thank for bringing about Totoro, Spirited Away, Castle in the Sky, Princess Mononoke, and many, many high-quality memes. The Anime News Network Encyclopedia lists Miyazaki as a key animator for episodes 77 and 80 of Sally the Witch. While I can't say for sure which sequences he worked on, I can say that in productions this old, it was a lot more common for key animators to handle most of an episode or even entire episodes by themselves, so I would not be surprised if the bulk of these episodes feature Miyazaki's work. Episode 77 especially has a lot of standout animation moments, such as this sequence of Poron shrinking down the triplets in a car, followed by them driving through giant leaves and underground tunnels. These shots have a surprising amount of detail and try for some interesting perspectives, such as when this mole chases a shrunken down Sally through the tunnels. Some of the car shots with the triplets seem like precursors to future works as well, with the dynamic animated backgrounds and wild driving choreography echoing scenes like the opening car chase from Lupin III, the castle of Cagliostro. Even if it turned out that none of this was Miyazaki's work, and I highly doubt that because that is totally a Miyazaki mole, this is all some stellar animation work for a weekly show from the late 60s, and it's interesting either way to see that this is the kind of production that Miyazaki cut his teeth on. Okay, so that's about all I have to say about the 1966 Sally series. I would say that wraps us up, but I still want to touch on a few related things that came out after the original anime. First is another series called Sally the Witch, that lasted 88 episodes from 1989 to 1991. Despite having the same title as the first series, this was not a remake or a reboot, but a direct sequel. For that reason, the series is often called Sally the Witch 2 to distinguish it from the 60s anime. In it, Sally is preparing to be crowned Queen of the Magic Kingdom when she finds out that Yoshiko's father has been hurt in a car accident, and that his taxi, the family's livelihood, is about to be junked. Sally, alarmed, tries to sneak out of her coronation with help from Cub and Poron, only to be discovered by her mother. Continuing the tradition of being a remarkably free-range parent, Mama lets Sally go to her friends, giving her a new magic wand to help her. After saving the Hanamuras, Sally puts down roots on Earth again, and the series continues in much the same way the 60s anime did, with Cub and Poron following Sally to Earth, and the whole group having more adventures together. The difference between the two series is obviously that Sally the Witch 2 had a higher budget and more modern animation techniques to work with, allowing for flashier magic, smoother motion, and more character expression than the original series. It also worked in a lot more tropes that had become staples of 80s anime, and especially 80s magical girl anime, such as a colorful animal sidekick, 
a suspiciously marketable magic item, and a lot of stereotypical 80s villains and plots. In addition to the main series, there were also two TV specials and a short theatrical movie made during this period. All three involve some kind of bad magical woman sowing evil in discord, usually by kidnapping one or more children, and then in the end the bad woman realizes that she was in the wrong the whole time and comes to her senses. Everyone goes on their merry way, the end. If you're curious about Sally the Witch, but don't think you'd be able to sit through the old black and white stuff, I recommend tracking down the movie for sure. It's very short, barely longer than a TV episode, and it's been fan subbed in English, so it'll give you a nice one and done taste of the franchise. Granted, it's a bit more high fantasy than most other Sally stories, but still, if you're only gonna watch one Sally thing, it's a pretty enjoyable thing. Anyway, last couple things I wanna mention before we finish. First is a 2015 song and music video by the idol group Anger Me. Uh, wait, no, it's. Angerme? Angerme? Oh my god, idols, stop it. Anyway, this group released a song called Mahot Sky Sally. And what do you know? It's a revamp of the original Sally theme. And a dang catchy one at that. I can't play it here due to YouTube's ever present copyright bots, but trust me, it is a major earworm. I recommend looking up both that song and the theme songs to the 60s and 80s anime to compare it to, as the evolution of the song itself is pretty interesting to hear. Last but not least, there is one more notable appearance Sally has made in anime, and it is not as Sally, but as Sunny. Remember that Yokoyama originally wanted to call his witch Sunny? Well, in the 1990s, there was a direct-to-video series called Giant Robo The Day the Earth Stood Still which was nominally an adaptation of Yokoyama's Giant Robo manga. However, due to a big, complicated mess of copyright that I will not get into, the staff working on this series could not actually use any of the characters from Giant Robo, except for the main character and the robot itself. So instead, the director of the series, Yasuhiro Imagawa, populated the supporting cast with characters from Yokoyama's other manga series, including Tetsujin 28, Water Margin, Babel II, Romance of the Three Kingdoms, and of course, Sally the Witch. The whole series is massively fun, even if you're not at all familiar with Yokoyama's works, with a lot of influences from Wagnerian opera, expressionist and noir film, and the sheer balls-to-the-walls craziness that is super robot anime. It's only seven episodes long, yet the series took six years to make almost. So each episode is filled with astounding levels of animation quality. It's one of the most sincere love letters to a manga creator's work ever put to screen, and even though Sunny slash Sally's part is small, it's extremely satisfying to see her and all these other rescued Yokoyama characters play off one another in this grand story. Definitely check it out if you can. And of course, again, if you can find the original Sally the Witch in any way, shape, or form, I highly recommend checking out at least a couple of episodes of that as well. You'll get a taste for what anime was like back at the dawn of the medium, you'll get to see the groundwork the show laid for many series to follow, and most importantly, you will get a cute, funny little show about magical hijinks that's still fun to watch today. And in the likely event that you can't get a hold of it, I hope this video at least gave you a good impression of what the show is like. That's all for today. Next time, we will be moving on to the second major trendsetter of the genre, Himitsu no Akko-chan, the first transforming magical girl anime. See you guys then! Thanks so much again to all my patrons who support me every month, especially Anna, Author X, Lavitz, Otaku no Podcast, Siren Burb, the universe's number one super idol, Nikko Nikko Ni! And Rally Vincent, who deserved better. Come on, you know she did. I wouldn't be doing this if not for the generous support of viewers like you. You can support me on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com slash Aaron Cerise. You can make a small one-time donation at ko-fi.com slash Aaron Cerise. Or you can always share this video and leave a like or comment to show your support. Thanks so much again, and have a good day! Goodbye!